Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome you all to the 80th annual scientific session of uh, Jaffna Medical Association. Um, I think this is going to be the fifth symposium during this session. And the theme is a healthy brain and a healthy mind. There are three eminent speakers going to talk in this symposium for the next one hour period. And uh, I will hand over to Dr. Ajini Arasalingam to introduce the first speaker. Thank you. Good morning. It's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Chaturi Suravira. She has obtained her BBS from Colombo and MD Psychiatry and MRCP Psychiatry UK. She is currently the senior lecturer in psychiatry, Department of Psychiatry, Faculty of Medicine, Colombo, and consultant psychiatrist, National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Now it's over to you, Dr. Chaturi. Thank you very much, Dr. Ajini. Um, and first of all, thank you very much for giving me the it's opportunity uh, to Dr. Siva Yogan and Professor Satyadas and the organizing committee. Right, so moving on to my uh, topic today, it's thoughts, cognitions, cognitive functions, and beyond. For all, all of us, thoughts are just an everyday occurrence. Like, you know, we think that we need to go to sleep. We need, we say that uh, we want to eat. We say that we think that um, uh, I don't like this person, but thoughts are something more complex and it's beyond that. Um, ju just to give you an example, if we take depression, um, in depression, along with feelings of sadness, lethargy, and anhedonia, you get the negative automatic thoughts that I am a worthless person, and uh, I might get the idea that I want to end my life. Just like that in manic patients, they would say that I'm really a great person and I have a, a, a lot of powers. So how do thoughts with chemical changes in the brain, which sort of connects it to a disease process? Let's identify what thoughts, cognitive, cognitive functions are. So thoughts, it has many um, definitions covert uh, symbolic responses to intrinsic or extrinsic stimuli, or it's the process of thinking. It could be an idea, image, opinion, or other productive thinking. I hate this, I love this, like that. Or attention or consideration given to something or someone. I love this person. And what are cognitions? That goes a little bit beyond the thoughts process. It's the, co the cognition is the mental action or the process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thoughts, experiences, and the senses. Like, let's say, I say that I like this uh, presentation, but then it involves a whole, that's the thought, but it involves a lot of processes like my previous experiences, what do I think about it? So a cognition is slightly one level above. And we have this unpleasant feeling when the thoughts uh, uh, react with each other, when the cognitions react with each other. Like I might like something, I don't like something, but sometimes they are made to do things that we don't like. So what is cognitive dissonance? Something that we come across day to day, every day. Cognitive dissonance describes the discomfort experienced when two cognitions are incompatible with each other. Like, we don't like this boss, but then we have to respect this person. So the cognitive dissonance comes up. And it occurs when you do something that goes against a value that's important to you. Or learn a new piece of information that it disagrees with a long-standing belief or opinion. This is the person who uh, explain this phenomena that we go through every day, which is very unpleasant at times. Moving on from thoughts to cognitions, the metacognitions. What are metacognitions? Awareness of one's own cognitive processes, often involving a conscious attempt to control them. So it's all about monitoring the control, okay? This person, I don't really like this person. Therefore, 
I need to know that each individual is different and to take each and every person in that individual way and treat them with dignity. So that's metacognitions. Moving on from metacognitions to another level is the cognitive functions. How we acquire information and process information is all about cognitive functions. So just to give uh, an idea of putting everything together, thoughts, let's say I have got four visitors, I should arrange lunch for them. And I also have the thought that they are vegetarians. And the cognitions are the person, you have to per order the food for eight people because you need to count. There are three people in the camp family and then there are four visitors coming in. So one extra, let's go for eight. What are the metacognitions? What if the food is bad and my visitors don't like it? Am I catastrophizing now so that, you know, you're monitoring your own thought, own thought processes? No, I should not be uh, having this negative thought here because we can't serve everybody. Then what is the example of cognitive functions here? We know there are three people at home and four people coming. So you have to estimate the food quantity. So that's estimation. And then we have to make the decision, okay, they came around 11 o'clock, which means closer to lunchtime. So I need to offer them, which is the judgment. And then we have to decide as to what they, um, uh, what they are going to be offered by us, because we need to keep previous experiences in our mind that they are vegetarians. And uh, we need to pro probably order food, which are vegetarian. So which is decision making. And then memory, I have to remember that they're vegetarians from my past experience. So that's cognitive functions. So that's simply putting how thoughts, cognitions, metacognitions, and cognitive functions put together. Because people tend to think that thoughts are just thoughts, but it's more beyond that. It's something that we can do many things with. And if we are very well aware with thoughts, cognitions, metacognitions, and cognitive functions, we can identify at least at medical professionals, what our deficits are, what our strengths are. And if you are going down on some certain cognitive functions like memory to be aware of it. So moving on to cognitive functions, which is very, very important. It's a, you can classify it in many ways, like the general process, it could be memory, attention, language, or executive functioning. Then it could be divided according to the brain functions, like let's say the frontal lobe or the temporal lobe, parietal lobe, because certain areas of the brain are uh, responsible for certain, uh, certain cognitive functions. Then it could be hierarchical or based on complexity, like it could be top down versus bottom up, where the basic sensory and the perceptual operations are the least complex, reasoning, problem solving, executive functioning, putting things together are the most complex. This is cognitive functions according to processes. So executive functioning, it could be planning, decision making, reasoning, judgment, whereas object naming, word finding, fluency, grammar, syntax, that's language, visual perception, how do we reverse? How do we find our way back home? That's why when it's deteriorated significantly that you can't find the toilet in your own house. So that's how significant the cognitive functions are. And sometimes when they're really, really deteriorated, you can't recognize your own face in front of the mirror. That's how cognitive functions are important. And then the memory components, it could be the short term memory, long term memory, it could be attention, which is very, very important. So cognitive functions according to brain area, like if I take the example of judgment or planning that is governed by the frontal lobe, whereas memory language governed by the temporal lobe, and then visual spatial, visual perception, color recognition in the occipital lobe. Why is this important? Because in certain lesions in the brain, you can localize according to the clinical manifestations to that particular 
uh, area and also we can expect if there is a lesion in that particular area that these these cognitive domains would be affected so these are the main cognitive domains executive functioning which involves planning decision making uh, working memory attention social cognitions recognizing of emotions which are very very important yes we do these things every day every second but how much are we aware although we are med medical professionals like if somebody like you know is having difficulty um recalling a name how do we do we um make note of that because sometimes we see even family members of um medical professionals coming in at late stages of dementia purely because it was not identified early so if there is an impairment in the cognitive functions there is a cognitive deficit so the impairment in an individual mental process that lead to acquisition of information or knowledge and that would impair how an individual understand and acts in the world let's take memory so sometimes uh, you start it by forgetting where um, the names or uh, what you uh, did in the morning or forgetting to pass a message but then later on as i mentioned earlier you don't even identify the family members in the family so that's how cognitive how important cognitive deficits are when it comes to assessment of cognitive functions you can go by the history mental state examination because the diagnosis is mainly going to be clinical however the emphasis given to the measurement or the assessment of cognitive functions is not very uh, uh, significant by all of us because it's very very important that we do it so when it comes to cognitive functions there are particular test that you could do to in identify the individual cognitive function whether there is impairment or you could do the extended cognitive function like for frontal parietal temporal or occipital to identify the lesion there so some of the tests that we can do for the frontal lobe i know it looks very uh, jumbled up so inhibitory control you ask the patient to name the color it's written in green so that's inhibitory control then the trail making test a so you have to join identify the pattern and join a slightly a uh, difficult uh, different version complex version trail making test b for attentional set shifting you have to identify a 1 to a and then to 2 and to b and this is for um uh set shifting and luria 3 so some tests that you can do to identify frontal pathologies these are impaired even in frontal lobe tumors the parietal lobe so you can test whether the patient can identify the finger or can calculate or whether there is a problem with the left right disorientation temporal lobe this is what we call commonly as the ray complex figure so how is it uh, impaired or how is it functional moving on to the tools because initially what i mentioned are the uh, clinical tests that we could do but you could use tools for cognitive assessment particularly as baseline in the management of dementia or to identify particular deficits in a certain area or for monitoring purposes after starting cognitive enhancers so this is the commonly used mini mental state examination and the montreal cognitive assessment scale Montreal cognitive assessment scale is better than mini mental state examination because it's more sensitive to uh, mild cognitive impairment and the milder versions of cognitive impairment because sometimes the patient might get 30 out of 30 in the MMSC but ultimately have impaired Montreal cognitive assessment scale indicating mild cognitive impairment or milder form of dementia so i have just for um complete mistake i have compared some of the uh, tools which we use in sri lanka which are validated for sri lanka as well see like mmsc it uses serial sevens whereas if we take something like r bands repeatable battery for um, a neuropsychological status it has it does not have 
orientation. But when it comes to delayed memory, it has a whole array of things that you could use for list recall, list recognition. So, and uh, some of the tests like the ASR, it checks fluency, which is frontal lobe. So that's why you might want to decide on which cognitive assessment tool that you need to do in order to diagnose. Because although we think that it's the memory impairment when it comes to cognitive deficits, if it is frontal lobe, um, frontotemporal dementia, it might be the personality, the decision making, along with um, uh, language that is deteriorated. That's why that we should go away from using mini mental state examination alone, but, mo but move on to other cognitive assessment tools. So cognitive impairment is seen in dementia, psychiatric disorders, even depression can lead to cognitive impairment. There can be isolated cognitive impairments, like, you know, as I mentioned, like in frontotemporal dementia, or because of a tumor where the frontal lobe is only involved. Same with the traumatic brain injury. This is what happens in the preclinical phase, which is a um, which is a, a silent phase. There are brain changes, there are cognitive dysfunction which is going on, but it's not significant. At the mild cognitive impairment state, the cognitive changes are of concern to individuals or the family. It's kind of uh, visible, but preserved activities of daily living. Then comes the dementia, which the mild, moderate, moderately severe, and the severe. So that's how it progresses. Attention or concentration might actually start to deteriorate, although we don't know, in our 30s, 40s. What can we do? Yes, there are the routine things that we do, like the cognitive enhancers or uh, dissecting away the tumor but there's something called cognitive rehabilitation as well, particularly in stable brain injuries that you could use, which can prompt to stimulate new learning so that the other cognitive domains which are stable and remain viable can take over the function that is being taken there, relearning, and can lead to improvement of domains of the deficit, which we can do. So in cognitive rehabilitation, we could use the remediation properties, uh, remediation techniques, as well as the cognitive compensatory approaches like errorless learning, cognitive adaptive training. So slowly in Sri Lanka, although this might so sound blue moons away, we are doing these things. And there are facilities to detect, like, you know, not only clinically, but in Colombo, fMRI is available, PET. So you can actually identify the deficits and uh, pinpoint the injuries and go for cognitive rehabilitation. So that's why I thought of emphasizing about cognitive rehabilitation here as well. So in summary, what I wanted to highlight was, although we have thoughts, there are thoughts, cognitions, cognitive functions, which are complex forms, and how we can do assessments of cognitive functions clinically, and uh, to do a little bit complex tasks, to go beyond the mini mental state examination, or to go beyond the attention, concentration, short-term memory, long-term memory, and orientation, and what can happen with cognitive impairment and rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chaturi, for this uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, we'll take the questions at the end of the session. So now I'll call upon Dr. Gajendan to introduce the second speaker for today. Thank you. Uh, the next topic is empathizing with uh, illness experience uh, by Dr. Amila Izuru. Um, he is currently working as senior lecturer in psychiatry, faculty of medicine and allied Sciences in uh, Junior City of Rajaretta, and he is also uh, serving as honorary consultant psychiatrist in Teaching Hospital Andhradapura. He has graduated from uh, Faculty of Medicine, Junior City of Ruhunu in 2004, and um, he has obtained his MD in Psychiatry uh, from PGM Colombo in 2014, and he also obtained MRCP in psychiatry, and um, he has published uh, many uh, research papers and articles in 
several um, peer-reviewed uh, local and international journals. And uh, he has uh, received uh, local and um, international research awards for his uh, research work. So without wasting the time, I will um, cordially invite Dr. Amile Isuru to deliver his talk. Uh, over to you, Dr. Amile. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, I must take this opportunity to thank uh, Jaffna Medical Association for inviting me to deliver this lecture. Um, so today I'll be talking about empathizing with illness experience. As medical professional, this is day and the every day. So we see patients, we diagnose patients, and we start treatment of patients. But most of us, we, we, we know how making a diagnosis might affect an individual patient, right? So we are planning to, uh, I'm planning to take you through uh, over these few topics, impact of a diagnosis, and what are the, uh, some different perspectives of it, and um, medically ex unexplained symptoms, and experience of death and dying. So impact of diagnosing an illness, this depends on many factors. We know the individual's personality, social support, individual's expectation and severity of illness and uh, probable prognosis of the illness. There are so many factors I involved in. And understanding how this diagnosing a severe illness affect individual it's really important to us because we'll be, if we deliver this message properly, we'll be able to build up a good therapeutic rapport and we'll be able to deliver a good outcome in this case. So engagement of patients is really good if you do this in a scientific way. Right. So scientific way of doing this, one way of doing this is breaking the bad news. So the, it is a very, it needs kind of a patience and skills and it, it needs a personal space as well, right? So there are few steps of doing this. And if you do this properly, it is really good to the patients and it, it's really good to you because patient engagement will be better and you can avoid lots of unnecessary scenarios as well, right? So one is, advanced preparation first of all you need to know what you are going to talk about it right usually breaking the bad news is done by a most senior most knowledgeable person on the board so i have seen many instances junior doctors break the bad news gave incorrect, incorrect information and nursing staff and other staff people uh, doing this casually and informal way which might have a huge impact on patients and family members. So we need to be prepared for this. We need to gather adequate knowledge. We need to know what we are going. We need to know the outcome of our interventions. And most importantly, we need to be emotionally prepared for this. Right. So when we talk to the patient, without straight away going into talking about patients recently diagnosed with illness, right? It's really important to build up a therapeutic relationship. And it's really important to get, uh, gather a few informations, right? Sometimes these informations may be really important for you to break in the bad news as well. And we have to communicate really well, avoid medical jargons, use simple language. You have to make sure that patient understand what you say, right? Because patient is under stress, patient is very anxious when patient knows that he is going to know something sinister or something serious. So you need to understand that patient might not have a good level of attention and concentration. So you need to give information to the level patient can understand what you say, right? And we have to prepare to deal with patients and family reactions. 
sometimes patient might start crying and fa family start shouting and they might come up with various reactions that all depend on individual personality and individual's frustration tolerance level and things like that so we need to be prepared for that right and after telling all these things and having a discussion we need to encourage and validate individuals emotions right we have to let patients to cry we have to let patients to express what he think about it we need to we need to let patients to kind of a, it's important to observe someone is skillful doing this because this if you do this properly you can avoid lots of unnecessary problems you can engage the patient with the future treatment plans and you can uh, ease out the patient there are very unfortunate incidences of uh, breaking the bad news and sometimes patients go home and take their own life and you might have remember in Australia, one of the orthopedic units, a doctor uh, came and told the patient that you are having a osteosarcoma, you are going to live only a couple of months, right? Patient's really frustrated and he, he brought a small uh, gun and shoot uh, on the ward. So that kind of emo extreme emotional reactions can occur, but that, those things are very rare. But if you do this very proper proper way, it will help to contain patients' anxiety and frustration as well. Right. I'm sure everyone knows this person, Lance Armstrong. Uh, he's a world record holder in cycling. And he was diagnosed as having a testicular malignancy with secondaries, right? He has told that I left my house on October 2nd, 1996 as one person and came home another. You can see the impact of knowing uh, the outcome of the illness, impact of knowing their diagnosis. It can completely change individual. Right. So as medical professional, we always have a bigger role to play. Right. We need to give adequate information. We have to make sure patients understand what we say, right? And we need to understand the impact. We need to understand the psychological impact. We need to understand the social impact. If a breadwinner of the family got a stroke, right? So it is a stroke medically. There can be lots of psychological consequences. There can be lots of social consequences as well right it is really important to understand how patient would cope and what are the resources available to help the patients to go through this difficult period yeah and it is also important to understand possible psychological defenses as well because diagnosing a serious illness causes immense anxiety Sometimes patients tend to deny that, to cope with that anxiety. For example, when you diagnose a patient with breast cancer, right? patient might go home and think, no, it's not like that. So this is just a tumor. This is not a malignancy. This is something normal. And patient might not come for the follow-up. right? So that is individual defenses. right? We need to understand that defense mechanisms as well so that so you can uh, talk to the patient, address their concern and slowly break the bad news again and again and get the patient engaged with the treatment protocol. Otherwise, we might miss the patient uh, completely if you do not understand this kind of psychological defenses. Right. So now I'm, I'm going to talk about a completely a different perspective of making a diagnosis nowadays in modern era we do lots of early diagnosis this is really good when you diagnose things early outcome is really good for example if you diagnose early uh, cervical carcinoma right so if you diagnose early uh, the risk factors of cardiac disease atherosclerosis you can intervene early right but there is a different perspective to that. 
So when we screen too much individuals, we do too much investigations, right? We rely on biomarkers, right? So we make lots of cause diagnosis, often lead to too many unnecessary interactions as well, right? So with this, for example, dementia, as Chaturi discussed, there are so many biomarkers, there are so many indicators to diagnose early dementia, right? So, at what age this dementia pro, uh, the start and uh, this process uh, progresses, right? So there are so many investigations, right? And in the pharmaceutical industry, make lots of interventions, right? Those are costly, and they get these things approved, and they rapidly approved for marketing, right? So it is. Sometimes it is very clear that these interventions are not effective, but they are costly. Patients experience only side effects and we are given false hope, right? There will be too many adverse reactions and too much inappropriate monitoring as well. And too much healthcare cost implies too little effective healthcare. So as a third world country especially, we don't have too much money. We don't have too much funds. We don't have too much uh, expenses we took too much funds to kind of maintain our health care cost. So in that context, if you waste our available resources on something unnecessary, this is going to be a real problem to uh, the country as a whole and at individual levels as well. Right? So this is and uh, again uh, different perspective, making an early diagnosis. As I told you early, early diagnosis outcome is good, but we need to be really careful about this. Making people, patients unnecessarily ill, right? By identifying problems that were never going to cause harm, right? There can be few changes, few anomalies, but those anomalies may not going to be harmful, but we do certain interventions as well. By medicalizing ordinary life experiences through expanded definition of diseases. For example, in COVID era, children are at home, they are very naughty, very active all the time, they do not have chance to go out and play, so they are overactive most of the time, they don't pay much attention and things like that. So people tend to overdiagnose attention deficit hyperactive disorder in, in, in the children and they start treating uh, with various sorts of medications which may cause unnecessary side effects and we are medicalizing normal behavior as a pathological phenomenon. Right. So I'm coming to the second part of the presentation that is medically unexplained symptoms, which is again really important for most of us, right? I would like to say the medically unexplained symptoms are quite common. It can cause great burden to individual and it can also incur large healthcare cost, right? So I will take you through some of the symptoms. There are so many symptoms you can see. Uh, presented as medically unexplained symptoms, right? It can affect almost all the system, right? So how do we understand the patient with medically unexplained symptoms? All these symptoms are real to patient. If you say this all, all are in your mind, don't worry, you don't have illness, right? That patient will never come back to you, right? But patient individually suffers a lot. Patient will go one doctor to another. Patient has symptoms. Patient has disability. We don't have a tool to help the patient. That is the real story. But we say you don't have illness. But in reality, patient might have illness. There can be comorbid psychiatric conditions like depression and anxiety. So medically unexplained symptom, this, the, this entity can be treated by a skillful uh, experts, right? So we can kind of uh, give these patients good quality of life. We can 
cure their symptoms. These patients cannot be reassured. However much you do investigations, however much you tell them you don't have illness, the patient will not be reassured. Doing more investigations does not help, right? So we think uh, when patient comes with various sorts of symptoms and presentations, we do so many investigations, we think we can reassure the patient, it doesn't work that way. We have to use non-judgmental approach. We might know that there is no underlying etiological factor, but these symptoms are real to the patient, but these symptoms cause real agony, psychological distress, physical and functional impairment as well. So this scenario is real to the patient, right? But our approach should be different. So how can we help? We need to identify medically unexplained symptoms early, right? Earlier, we, earlier the diagnosis, diagnosis is better than outcome, right? So we need to understand and we need to pick up these cases and we need to do appropriate referrals. Otherwise, as these patients go on uh, with having all these symptoms, it is really difficult to treat them. They will suffer forever and this is a huge healthcare burden, right? So moving on to the last uh, topic of my lecture, experience of death and dying. So we all know death is inevitable. But most of us do not prepare for dealing with death. So that is the reality. And some people feel quite contented and peaceful about death. Right? But some people, even though they are very old, even though they achieve many things in life, even though they do not have <coughs> much things to bother, they really struggle to face the reality of death. Right? As medical professionals, we need to understand the experience that individuals are going through when they are facing with death in order to help them properly. We all know physical aspect of death. Sometimes, for example, terminal illness, malignancy, those things go long period of time. It is very painful. We need to address pain and make the patient comfortable. Sometimes death is quite peaceful and quite quick. Right? The emotional aspect of death. Right? There are co-emotional aspects of death uh, described uh, by Kubler-Ross. And the first one is denial and isolation. When someone realizes that there is no much time for him or her to live, initially they deny, they don't accept, right? Then they become angry. This anger you might see toward themselves or towards others, right? Then as patient progress through this period, patient becomes depressed and eventually patient accepts the death, right? So this is no, there is no proper order. Sometimes when individuals accept the death and they can again uh, shift to the depressive or anger or denial phase as well, right? So it's really important to understand these stages of getting adjustment uh, for, for us to psychologically help individuals facing death. And the spiritual and existential aspects need to be addressed. So this is the last part of this individual. This individual wishes need to be addressed. His uh, spiritual needs and exist spiritual needs needs to be addressed. And social aspect. So once an individual diagnosed as having uh, diagnosed having a serious illness, or we know when we know that this individual has no much time to live most of the time social death occurs right most of the people do not want to interact with the individual right because they don't know what to say right so that social death occurs before the physical death so this is not going to be helpful and there are a few practical aspects as well people often find it difficult to discuss end of life plans living wills and funeral arrangement right but these are elements of dying process 
that you can discuss long before they are needed. You can discuss before you de die what kind of people you would like to associate uh, in your last days of life, right? What kind of arrangements you would like to uh, make, what it could uh, likely to be your deathbed and what it likely to be your funeral and things like that, right? So that you can arrange the social network and medical support and psychological support and spiritual support. So this is kind of a multidisciplinary work, right? So it is always really important to plan death. And we, we can facilitate this if we know uh, about these aspects. Right. Thank you very much. It was a, a excellent um, talk and uh, which was very informative and thought provoking. And uh, we will move on to the third and uh, last part of the symposium. Uh, Dr. Ajinia Rasalingam will introduce the third speaker. To introduce uh, Dr. Bahesan Ganeshan, uh, who is our next speaker. He's currently a consultant psychiatrist at the National Institute of Mental Health, Angoda Colombo, where he has been serving as a consultant since 1995. His main achievement has been instrumental in developing a community mental health service model. His contribution to mental health is exceptional. So without much delay, it's over to you, Dr. Ganeshan. Thank you. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the JMA uh, for inviting me on this panel to talk about uh, uh, reflecting on the dilemmas of choosing the right balance. Right. Uh, with the limited time I have, of course, I cannot talk about all the dilemmas and all the things about balance, but I want to touch on a few things uh, in generally and to contemplate and think and do something about it. Sometimes it works. So when we talk of balancing, uh, generally we think of two sides of a scale, right? Um, so balancing one side against the other, uh, that is what balancing is about. So as doctors, we balance or try to balance multiple scales at the same time. In trying to do so, often we mess up things a little, leading to unhappiness and problems. So what I plan to do today is to look at some areas where balancing becomes important to our personal and professional lives. So. If we look at the practice of medicine, now that is what most of us do, right? Some of us could be in administration, but basically we are all clinicians. And that is a field, the practice of medicine, can, that can give us a lot of satisfaction and happiness. Of course, on the other hand, some unhappiness and irritation also possible. So getting this balance right is pretty important for us to lead a happy life. So let us look at that first for a few minutes. So what are things in our encounters with patients that can give us satisfaction and happiness? Yes, making the right diagnosis is going to be one of the things. So a patient comes with you know, multiple complaints and they express it in many different ways. And when we hit the right diagnosis, wow, I know what the problem is. That is an opportunity to harness, to gather some happiness. So it is a bit of a detective work, as you know, isn't it? Uh, to weed through the unnecessary stuff they say, pick up the important cues which they the patients may not think as important, asking the right questions where they have missed out. So whether it is an abdominal pain or any other complaint for that matter. Unfortunately,
largely. Okay, how, how many of us do this now? In the state or even in the private sector? Very often, what I see is we are treating symptoms. And so we don't do this detective thing. And we doubt and come to a diagnosis. Yeah, sometimes a diagnosis is not possible when we come to a differential diagnosis. That is what we learned in medical school. Right? Yes. So, for some unknown reason, I don't know why, we seem to be avoiding this. So what do we do? We end up with polypharmacy. Right? And we start treating the symptoms. Of course, then polypharmacy is one of the features of that. And of course, it does cause prolonged suffering for the patient. And it's even to us. Because they keep coming back. And the satisfaction of treating somebody successfully is something that we are going to miss out on. So, this is happening even in my field. Right? So many of us end up prescribing an antipsychotic, an antidepressant, and or a hypnotic, maybe with some vitamin preparations. Right? I, I'm sure it happens in all specialities. So it is so sad. The great opportunity to do some detective work, arriving at a differential diagnosis, right? Using hypothesis forming and deduction, and deciding on the right investigations to tease out the diagnosis is missed. Now that is an opportunity, an inbuilt opportunity in our practice, in the field that we work, to feel good. So we should try not to miss out on this. So another opportunity, I talked a little bit about it already, is getting the patients better. This, of course, we do very often. Right? Many of the patients who come to us, some of them are cured, Many of them recover to some extent where they can get on with their lives happily. And this we do very often. But do we get the happiness that we are due for doing this? If not, why not? Let us look at this for a moment. Freeing a fellow human being from suffering should definitely bring us happiness and contentment. It's, it's nat only natural that we feel good when we help anybody, whether we are paid for that specifically, like in the private sector, or we are paid collectively in the government sector, or even when we do it voluntarily without any uh, kind of a financial or other gains. So why are we missing out on that bit of happiness? We need to do one or two things to earn that happiness fully. Firstly, we need to empathize with our patients and their families to how they feel when they are suffering from the disease. And continue that and how they feel when they are relieved of their symptoms which they were suffering from when they came to us. So, if we learn to empathize with our patients and understand and have a feel for the suffering that they are having, naturally, we are going to partake on the relief, on the happiness, um, the satisfaction they are going to have when they recover. So putting ourselves in their position and trying to understand the pain and the suffering they undergo is the meaning of empathy, right? Yes. So we are school taught in med school and even in our postgraduate studies about the importance of empathy. It is not only good for the patient because definitely when you empathize, you are more systematic 
and you come to the right diagnosis, it is also good to us when we successfully treat someone. And I said earlier, that is a common outcome. So remember that. Another way is to get the feedback of the contentment of the patient and the family when they get better. Grateful patients are very happy of their uh, recovery and, and offer the gratitude to us. Surely, when somebody thanks us for something, that should naturally make us feel happy. Right? Surely, we should feel good. But there is one caveat for us to get this. We need to do one little thing. That is to treat them with sensitivity and respecting their human dignity. Right? If we trample on those in an insensitive manner, we are not going to get their gratitude in a frank and open manner. They may feel gratitude, still they may feel gratitude, but I don't think they are going to ex express that unless we treat them sensitively and in a dignity, maintaining their human dignity. So again, at times, we make it more difficult for ourselves. Right? How often do we smile? How often do we greet our patient? How often do we talk sensitively towards our patient? The opportunity is there for us. It's very rarely you're going to get a patient who is going to be confrontational or aggressive towards a doctor. They may be confrontational, aggressive towards lots of other people. Right? Maybe with their family members, neighbors, you know, other officers, or when they go shopping, they can. But especially when they come to us as doctors, they are going to be very good. They are going to be uh, very kind and sensible in their communication. So reciprocating this is not difficult at all. In spite of that, we miss out on this many times. So we need to remember when we scold or when we are nasty towards our patient, we are missing out on our own happiness. So even from a selfish perspective, right, uh, we need to be kind and sensitive to our patients, and then the gratitude will come out. Sometimes in words, but definitely by the way they smile, by the way they look. You know, nonverbal communication is as important. Yes, many of them will be verbalizing as well. Sure, interaction with patients can bring some pain and unhappiness too especially when they are suffering from conditions where we can do nothing to cure or nothing to relieve their suffering. Remember, that's not very common, but it does happen. Right? When they make unreasonable requests, it can, make a, a give, it can give a very unpleasant feeling for us. Right? So, being a psychiatrist, one of the things that can often annoy me is people coming and asking for bogus medical certificate for some purpose or other to be medically condemned or seek asylum elsewhere. It, it still annoys me. It still annoys me when people come thinking that I will give a bogus medical, you know, saying that they are suffering from trauma or something because they want to get uh, asylum or citizenship in another country 
or they want to get medically condemned for some purpose so that they want to get the money or pension or whatever. It, it, it annoys me. But I try to keep that annoyance minimal and not generalize it. And also partly, I'm also in some ways responsible as a member of the psychiatric community. Because some of us in the past or in the present do this out of the idea that we are helping our patients or maybe for financial reasons. So people have got the idea, hey, if I go to a psychiatrist, I may be able to get this uh, bogus medical certificate or letter. So I can't always blame the patients for this or their families. It is my profession to some extent that is responsible for giving this idea to our patient. So having that understanding helps me to minimize my annoyance towards the patients and the families. Right? But overall, if you look at it, I'm sure you will agree with me. The opportunities for the balance to be tilted in favor of feeling good is much more likely than the opposite of being tilted towards unhappiness, especially when it comes to our professional life. Right? So how we adjust these things, what I talked about up to now, is the key for us to get happiness from this perspective. Let us look at some aspect of our personal lives uh, that we need to get the balance right to feel peace and happiness. And the issue that I want to talk about is the issue of money. If some of us came into this profession thinking that we can earn a lot and can become really rich, would be very disappointed and feel very tired. So either they are going to be very disappointed or they are going to be very tired. Look, I'm going to say something that could maybe be very unpopular among some of you. If you look at the earnings of doctors, I'm talking of our salaries, including allowances and other benefits like overtime and other things just from the Ministry of Health. We have to accept that we are within the top one or two percent of earners in the country. Am I right? This might be a little difficult for us to accept, but that is the truth. But still, I come across doctors who complain a lot about the low pay. If you put this as a basic criterion for us to feel happy, then we are going to harvest plenty of unhappiness. Am I right? And fairly reasonably good businessman with some intelligence can make much money much more money than us in a short time with less work. Say for example, just being a land broker, especially in Jaffna now, will definitely get you more money. I'm in no way undervaluing their effort or hard work. Right? They do work hard, they do use it lose their brains and they may have to run around a little bit. But just if we take the amount of time that we need to spend to earn money, it's definitely much more for us than them. Okay? Then 
why are we unhappy even if when we accept that we are among the top percentages when it comes to money that is because we are in a rat race okay. look any of us who have become doctors we are competitive in nature that is why we succeeded in competitive exams and came to do medicine and then some of us ended up doing postgraduate as well so that competitive attitude we had really helped us that's not necessarily a bad thing but unfortunately that competitive attitude we carry through to our earnings as well so we compare with other doctors we compare with others in the society and we want to have and spend money like them or more than them not because we need it to feed the family or anything no definitely not the other reason is to show the society that i am successful i mean financially successful i don't know why we really have to do this and the society knows that we are doctors and we, we do get respect from them mm -hmm. just being doctors mm -hmm. right so whether we need it or not many of us want a good car mm -hmm. a good house etc mm -hmm. and of course mm -hmm. those things are expensive we end up taking loans just to show that we are well off to our colleagues and the society so i have been criticized even by my colleagues for coming to work in a motorbike i was told by them it brought disrespect and dishonor to them if someone is going to respect me or honor me based on the vehicle i come to work or the brand of car i'm having then i'm not too interested in that respect and honor i right? don't all of us have inherent fixed equal values as human beings and living things how can possession of possession of wealth increase my value oh yes i agree we need money i fully agree with that no issue about that there is a big difference between needs and wants i don't have to spell out the difference between the two the needs we have and the wants we have unfortunately what has happened is in our lists there are many items in the want list and many of us have shifted many of those items into a need list the things i really need of course this is going to make us unhappy because fulfilling those extra items in the need list is going to be very difficult so that is why i said we are going to be either unhappy or tired so when we try to earn more money uh, we have to work much harder we will have less you know less time less time to send on other things and this also leads to discontent and unhappiness so two things here that make us unhappy getting into the rat race the option is always there to opt out of it let them have a better car if they like fine let them have a big house if they want fine let them have more qualification if they want fine this is what i want i am going to be content and happy with this and the other is the confusing wants and needs spend some time reflect on this am i in a rat race i mean this rat race does not end with us it even includes our children 
we want to see our children competing with our colleagues' children in the year five scholarship exams, O levels, A levels. So unfortunately, our children are also included in this. So not only we suffer because we are in this competitive comparisons in the rat race, we make our children also suffer due to this, of our confusion on this competitive nature. Also remember, there is opportunities all around us for us to be happy as well, all the time. What? When we are busy with the about things, we miss out on harnessing and witnessing those happy things, and we miss out on being happy. I mean little, little things. See, happiness often works like a pill box. You know, when we were small, we used to collect coins. Okay? Accumulating little by little, and end up with a significant amount of you know, collection. And these little, little things are happening all the time. By the people around us, by nature, you know, witnessing, you know, two puppies playing, or one person helping another person, or the smell of, you know, rain um, on the soil. You know, when, there's, when it starts raining, you know that. You know, you get a lovely smell. Right? So there are these little, little things. You know, small acts of kindness from our family members, from our relatives, from our neighbors, saying hello to somebody. There are little, little things that add up. We may not realize they are happy, happy things, but they all add up. Unfortunately, we ignore these little, little things and wait for the big happinesses to come. Of course, the big happinesses are going to come. But unfortunately, they are, they are going to be very infrequent. They are not going to happen to us. Winning the lottery is not going to happen every day. Buying a new car is not going to happen every day. Our children getting very good results in these, you know, all the exams I mentioned, is not going to happen today. So fine, feel happy for that as well. But don't leave out on the little, little things. And also, there are other things that give, can give us a lot of happiness. Being with family, being with friends, doing little bits of charity, etc. can do that. So, the thing is, what I want is for us to reflect a little bit right, on this. Spend one or two minutes looking at our happiness meter. How happy am I today? How content am I today? If not, why not? See, we don't have to spend a lot of time doing this. I'm talking about two to three minutes a day. We can even do it like on the way to work while walking in the corridors of the hospital. We can do that. Just look at what is it that is making me unhappy. What is it I have done today or what I can do today in my professional life to make it a happy day? which is going to add up. So spending that few minutes just looking at our happiness meter can make a big difference in tilting the balance of our lives towards more happiness. And I can assure you, it's definitely achievable, especially in our profession. Thank you very much. Uh, we thank Dr. Ma uh, Ganeshan for his excellent uh, talk. Uh, since we are running late uh, due to lack of time, uh, we are not taking any questions at the end of this symposium. Thank you.